Many of you will have seen different representations of the carbon cycle. I tend to look and focus my research and the research of my group on the atmosphere, plant, soil side of things. I don't work in the oceans, but it's important to acknowledge that the atmosphere-ocean interface is an important part of the carbon cycle. So when I see this diagram, I always hone in on the soil carbon part. You can see a big white arrow going from a tree down into the ground. And all of the white numbers in this representation of the global carbon cycle are stocks or pools of carbon. So you can see 2,300 gigatons of carbon is stored in the soil. People often think about growing more trees to store carbon above the ground in the terrestrial biomass. And that is definitely an important part of our response to climate change. But if you look closely to around the tree and the plant area, and you'll see that there's 550 gigatons of carbon stored in that above ground biomass. That's all across the planet. The yellow numbers are the fluxes that are occurring of carbon moving from one pool to the other. We've got 800 gigatons of carbon up into the atmosphere and we're constantly taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it back in, not only through our burning of fossil fuels, but also natural processes. Plants really are our allies in the fight against climate change because they are continuously taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it together inside their bodies with sunlight and water and nutrients that they've got from the soil to create solid stored carbon, the body of plants. And then there's four possible fates for this solid carbon, which largely end up in it going back into a gaseous form. So one, the plant can be burnt. People and other animals can eat the plant. The plants also break down these structures within their own bodies. And finally, as the plants die and decay, they're eaten or partially eaten by bacteria and fungi. And it's this fourth pathway that enables some of that carbon to not be returned to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide, but instead to form soil carbon. The majority of the soil carbon is at the surface of the soil. You can see much darker carbon where the soil interacts with the atmosphere and also really the crucially important role of plants in moving carbon down to deeper depths in the soil. In many places, we've changed the way that we manage the land to actually increase the amount of respiration that's occurring. So there's less photosynthesis and more respiration. So we've altered that natural carbon cycle such that agricultural lands are large emitters of greenhouse gases. And those emissions have almost doubled just since 1965. So while we talk a lot about keeping coal in the ground and keeping fossil fuels in the ground and not opening up new mines, Not many people are aware that we've also been mining soil carbon inadvertently in the way that we manage the majority of our food producing landscapes. Restoration of these degraded landscapes has the potential to store lots of carbon and particularly in wetland soils, which is much of the focus of the work of my group at RMIT. And I want to particularly introduce you to peat. This is a handful of extremely carbon-rich soil. Peatlands need water. They need to be wet. They are a type of wetland. They're a subset of wetland. And to enable that balance between the carbon being fixed through photosynthesis and the carbon then being respired and returned to the atmosphere by microbial respiration, Water hinders that breakdown of plant material. So peatlands need to stay wet to exist. And they also need not to have a lot of tracks or drains or roads or physical disturbance 
through them. But in return, peatlands provide. They also provide water. It might seem counterintuitive. I'm saying on the one hand, they need water, and on the other hand, they provide water. But it's true. This part of Australia is really important hydrologically to this, our dry country, for a number of reasons. You might be aware of our hydroelectricity generation, Snowy Hydro, and in Victoria we also have a smaller hydroelectricity generated from Rocky Valley Dam operated by AGL. That placement of hydroelectricity in the Alps was very considered and strategic. These are high rainfall and low evapotranspiration parts of our country, and so they're the ideal place to be capturing and storing large amounts of water to generate hydroelectricity. So as well as that important hydrologic role, peatlands also provide soil carbon sequestration. They provide a safe, long-term storage for carbon. The tiny little sphagnum mosses and the other shrubs and plants that grow in the peatlands are just, you know, growing slowly each year, but they've been doing so and storing that carbon in the soil, in the build-up of peat for thousands of years. And what we found is that Australian alpine peatlands, this one in particular that we're studying, it's still forming peat and, in fact, it's a strong sink for carbon. This is an ecosystem worth restoring because it's doing some really important work for us. We're now going to look at a more local example of carbon farming where the Warren Bean Farm Collective in central Victoria is transitioning their family farm from a traditional merino sheep enterprise to a modern day carbon farm. The Warren Bain Farm Collective is still farming sheep on this property, but in a different way. Regenerative agriculture allows them to just switch the focus a little from a purely animal production focus to taking a whole systems, a whole landscape and social ecological systems approach and both grow sheep to eat as well as storing more carbon in the soil. It's subtle changes in the number of stocks, stock that are kept on the land, on the way stock are managed and moved around the property. But after just 18 months, they're already starting to see the results. And I'm going to leave you tonight with the Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals have been developed by the UN and taken on at all different levels of society. So I've put a green circle around number two, zero hunger, number six, clean water and sanitation, number 13, climate action. I'm sure after tonight you're very clear on how soils relate to climate action. And also number 15, life on land. These four goals clearly are linked with soils and soil science. And if we overlay the food system on top of those circles with these red circles, you'll see that between food and soils, we have the majority of the sustainable development goals covered. So when you're thinking about climate action, I hope that you will not ignore the possibilities right below your feet and that you'll support farmers who are doing so and advocate to our governments to support both legislation and practical action around storing more carbon in the soils and enabling consumers to make those supportive choices as well through a soil carbon certification scheme. And if you want to learn more about any of these things, it would be fantastic to hear from you. Thanks.